Good afternoon. My name is Adrian Dix. I'm BC's Minister of Health. To my right is Dr. Bonnie Henry, BC's Provincial Health Officer. Uh, this is our COVID-19 briefing for British Columbia for Monday, November the 16th. We're honoured to be here on the territory of Lekwungen speaking people of the Songhees and the Esquimalt First Nations. Uh, tomorrow, Tuesday and uh, Wednesday, we'll be providing written briefings at 3 o'clock with uh, uh, case count information and other relevant information related to COVID-19 in British Columbia. On Thursday, uh, here in Victoria, we'll be providing another briefing on COVID-19, in-person briefing on COVID-19 in British Columbia. And with that, it's my honour to introduce Dr. Bonnie Henry. Thank you and good afternoon. Uh, for today's briefing, we are reporting on three periods. From Friday to Saturday, uh, we had 654 new cases diagnosed with COVID-19. From Saturday to Sunday, an additional 659 people were diagnosed. And between Sunday and today, 646 new cases. That um, adds up to 1,959 people who have been diagnosed with COVID-19 over this weekend, including three epidemiologically linked cases, bringing our total in British Columbia to 22,944 people with COVID-19. By health authority, the new cases over the last three days are 455 people in Vancouver Coastal Health, 1,361 people in the Fraser Health Region, 41 people on Vancouver Island, 87 people in Interior Health Region, 14 people in the Northern Health Region, and one a case in a person who resides outside of Canada. We're now up to 6,279 active cases around the province in all health authorities, of whom 181 people are in hospital, 57 of whom are in critical care or ICU. Sadly, we've had nine new deaths from COVID-19 over the weekend, bringing our total to 299. The majority of these people were older, people living in long-term care or people who with underlying illnesses in hospital. But we are always struck by the challenges and the tragedy um, of having to deal with deaths at this time when it is so challenging for all of us. And our condolences and our thoughts are with the family members and the caregivers and the communities of these people. We continue to have um, a large number of people under active public health monitoring, 10,928 people and 16,087 people who have now recovered from COVID-19. Over this past three days as well, we've had 11 new healthcare outbreaks in facilities primarily in Vancouver Coastal, but also in the interior and uh, sorry, in Fraser Health and Vancouver Coastal and in interior health. They are at the Al Hogg Pavilion, the Jackman Manor, the George Derby Centre, the Kiwanis Care Centre, Columbus Residence, Holy Family Hospital again, uh, the Arbutus Care Centre, the Picks Assisted Living Centre, the Village by the Station, Hamlets at West Side and Burnaby Hospital. Four outbreaks were declared over in the past weekend, including Harrow Park Centre, which is a relief to all of us, knowing the challenges that have gone on at Harrow Park more than once in this pandemic, Pine Grove Place, the village at Mill Hill, and Rosemary Heights Seniors Village. We now have 52 active outbreaks in our health care system, 45 in long-term care and assisted living, and seven in acute care. Additionally, there have been a number of exposure events in our community and two new declared community outbreaks, one at the Platinum Athletic Club and the other our second school outbreak at the Cambridge Elementary School in the Fraser Health Region. As the number of cases and outbreaks is showing, we are in the most challenging of times. We have come through a wave, we're now in the midst of our second and it has become even more challenging and the virus is not stopping. We are um, trying to put in place the measures that we know will work, learning what we have learned. Through the COVID-19 pandemic, we also know that the individual efforts of people across BC have helped 
and are the reason we are keeping our hospitals, our schools, and workplaces open, and protecting the ones we love. It is these small yet essential efforts that all of us do that have a big collective impact. Things like staying home when we're ill, not having social gatherings. This has become even more critical in the past few weeks. And as you know, we put on orders around specific areas in the Vancouver Coastal and Fraser Health regions. But we are also reminding people around the province this virus is in our communities and can spread very easily. We need to say no to social gatherings right now. We also need to minimize our travel, maintain our safe distances as best we can at all times, and use masks. I have been asked many times about why we do not have a, a provincial order mandating mask use here in BC. And the answer is, as I have said many times, in many locations, we already do. And we know that it's an important part of the individual efforts that we do every day, like cleaning our hands, like coughing into our sleeve, like maintaining our physical distances. Wearing masks is now more than ever an important measure that we individually need to take. Let's remember that today we have seen that much of the transmission is occurring in private homes, at social gatherings, and in settings like workplaces where people are gathering together, not where we're having um, slight, um, very short interactions in a public setting. We also know that transmission is happening in some group indoor settings, like group fitness activities, and we've seen some large transmission events related to these. We've seen transmission happening as well when people are gathering before and after going to um, safe events, which may be watching a game, um, picking up children from school, going to a restaurant. As a result, we put in orders to, in, to control those, um, the interactions we have at these high-risk locations. These are all locations where there are no other layers of protection, and place and people are not wearing masks. In our own homes, we don't have plexiglass barriers. We don't keep our physical distancing. And those are the settings that are most challenging right now. This is not to say masks are not important. We have learned about the importance of masks over this past 10 months. And we know that they are yet another important measure that we must all embrace. Masks are important in businesses, in public spaces, on transit, in stores, on ferries, when we are around people we don't know and are unable to always maintain our safe distance. This also includes indoor public places like shopping malls, like community centers, like uh, stores and retail spaces where we have seen transmission occur. Let's remember that businesses are required to ensure the health and safety of their employees. And we have an order that requires every business to have a COVID-19 safety plan in place to operate safely. This is no different than a requirement to follow fire codes or meet sanitation requirements. In addition to such things as making sure there's barriers where needed, having fewer people in spaces, um, health screening, masks are the cornerstone of most and many of these COVID-19 safety plans in settings across the province. Masks should and need to be a part of all the plans for all businesses or organizations that have public areas or require employees to gather. For customers without a mask, they should be available. And for people who cannot wear a mask, businesses can provide virtual or curbside service instead. As employees and customers, we are also required to abide by these plans. You wouldn't ask a business owner to operate outside of their posted business hours, nor should you expect them to bend their COVID-19 rules for you. All of us need to pay attention to this, whether we work in this, these settings or whether we're customers or clients. In addition to using our safety layers and avoiding socializing right now, I strongly encourage people to limit your travel as much as possible. And that is in all areas of the province. 
we have asked that only essential travel um, be considered to and from the areas where we're seeing most transmission in the communities. But I call upon people across the province. We need to go back to how we were thinking earlier on in this pandemic, when the virus was in our community. We know a lot more now, and we know that the virus comes with us. And when we travel, we bring that risk with us, and we take home the risk from where we've been. So now is not the time to travel for recreational or non-essential purposes, whether it's from the lower mainland to the island, whether it's between the interior and the north, or whether it's to and from other provinces in Canada. We need to stay local, stay in our communities now, and take those measures which will help us bend our curve back down. This is this is a challenging time. Getting through this surge in new cases and through this pandemic requires all of us to go back to thinking about the important things we knew that we need to keep doing to support each other to do those too. It's how we reduce our risks, we protect our families, those we are closest to, our loved ones and our communities. People in British Columbia continue to show unwavering resilience and adaptability. And we know we know what to do. We know we can do it. And we know we can support each other to get through this challenging time. Let's support our friends, our neighbours, our schools, our workplaces, our hospitals, and take care of those who are most at risk by using all of our layers of protection. We will get through this. We've had some more encouraging information today about vaccines, but we have a ways to go to get there. And now we have to step, step back and take those actions collectively, everybody doing their bit to get us through this next few months. And we will do this. We will do it together and we will care for each other and we'll be kind and we'll be calm and that will keep us safe. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Henry. Uh, as Dr. Henry has said, nine people passed away over the last three days in British Columbia from COVID-19. Two from Friday to Saturday, four from Saturday to Sunday, three from Sunday to today. And uh, I wanted to pass on my condolences to the, to the families, of course, to the caregivers, uh, because the majority of these cases come from long-term care and all of these cases involve uh, our elders and uh, that has uh, a profound impact on families and on caregivers and on communities. Uh, this is an extraordinary time uh, to deal uh, with COVID-19 everywhere in BC. Uh, in fact, six of these uh, people passed away in Fraser Health, but two in Vancouver Coastal Health and one in Northern Health. So it's affecting communities and does affect and will affect communities across BC. And on behalf of uh, the government, I think everyone in BC will want to pass on our thoughts at this very difficult time to grieve to all those families and all those who have been affected uh, uh, during this pandemic. 299 people have died uh, related to COVID-19 in BC since the beginning of the pandemic, and we grieve every single one of them. I wanted to uh, note a couple of things and just to say with respect to um, public health, uh, the extraordinary work that's going on. We've talked about uh, significant, significantly the amount of contact tracing, the work in public health being done. 10,928 people who are under public health surveillance who are self-isolating, 6,282 active cases, 32,600 and a little bit more tests done over the last three days in British Columbia, which is a significant number and a massive effort. Uh, by public health everywhere. Uh, every Monday I bring people up to date on uh, PPE that has arrived in BC. As you know, uh, since March to Monday, November 9th, when we last reported, uh, just over uh, 7 million 400,000 and 94, 95, I should say, are equivalent respirators. Just over 126 million surgical or procedure masks, almost 2.9 million pieces of eye protection, 
almost 222 million 500,000 pairs of gloves and just over 13 million 300,000 gallons. Over the last week uh, since the update on M Monday, November 9th, the following PPE has arrived in BC. 49,166 N95 or equivalent respirators, 352,250 uh, surgical or procedure masks, 1,325 pieces of eye protection, 1,164,800 pairs of gloves, and 703,974 gowns. These numbers do not include supplies that arrived in YVR late last week on a massive uh, Antonov car cargo plane which contains 650 cubic meters or 430 pallets of PPE for the healthcare system. The Provincial Health Services Authority supply chain is working to move that significant volume of PPE to the main warehouse for sorting, counting and validation and I expect to report on these volumes uh, next week, but I want to express my appreciation to everyone in the Ministry of Health, the PHSA and the health authorities who are working to provide the equipment necessary for our extraordinary health care teams to do what they do every week. This is uh, an all-in 100 percent effort in our health care system. Uh, last week, 7,000 surgeries performed more than normal, uh, hundreds of thousands of people being immunized more than normal. All of the people I talked to about under public health surveillance, all the testing that's being done, uh, all of the long term care and assisted living homes that are currently on outbreak protocol. This is an enormous effort by everyone in public health. It's a seven day a week effort by everybody. And a lot of the preparations that have been made uh, leading into this are uh, proving themselves to have been necessary, I would say. And we have to continue to support our healthcare workers, not just as we did at one time in the pandemic at 7, 7 p.m., but all the time. And how we do that, I think, is very simple. We all have to be involved in stopping the spread in those regions and in every region of BC. And of course, it's not just healthcare workers, it's teachers and administrators and people who work in our public school systems who I think have done an admirable and remarkable job in doing all of the work they normally do and in dealing with COVID-19 protocols in schools, all of the people who provide us services in our community that are necessary, the people that I meet at Save on Foods and everyone else, all of those people require all of us to be all in. Last week, Fraser Health put out a, an infographic, a kind of flow chart that showed how COVID-19 spread when just one person brought the virus to a wedding. There was another about a fitness center, another about a workplace. And what it tells us, I think, is how all of these events are linked, that we have to have a massive response in our healthcare system, but we all have to do what we can do. And there are things that we can do. And Dr. Henry just talked about the things that we can do to make things better, how we can work together by standing apart. Right now, each of us needs to close the gaps and seals the cracks that allow COVID-19 into our lives and that can see us infect others in turn, often the people we love most. Each of us must consider our actions. Each of us must think of our behavior. Each of us must pause to consider if our next step will make us sick or spread the virus. We need to do that in support of all of the people of, in our communities, the people we love and the people we don't know, and that is especially necessary now. On Thursday, we'll be providing a new update, as you know, Nine days ago, uh, Dr. Henry brought in new measures in British Columbia and on Thursday we will be looking, uh, that will have been almost two weeks, 12 days at that point and you will hear more uh, at that time about, uh, about uh, further steps or what might happen at that point. So you'll be hearing that not today but on Thursday. Je veux dire en français aujourd'hui que nous faisons le point sur le nombre de nouveaux cas pour trois périodes de référence de 24 heures chacune, soit celle des 13 et 14 novembre, celle des 14 et 15 novembre et celle de, du 15 jusqu'au 16 novembre en mi-journée. Il y a eu neuf nouveaux décès liés au COVID-19 durant ces trois périodes de référence et nous offrons nos condoléances aux familles et aux amis des 299 personnes décédées de COVID-19 et tous ceux qui ont perdu leur des êtres chers au cours de cette pandémie. Euh, je veux dire euh, que chaque régime de santé compte des patients atteints de COVID-19. Euh, 6694 se trouvent à Vancouver Coastal, 14178 euh, à Fraser, 
à 379 sur l'île de Vancouver, 1088 euh, dans l'intérieur et 522 au nord. Il y a eu aussi 90 cas de personnes qui, qui vivent en dehors du Canada. Parmi l'ensemble des cas confirmés de COVID-19, 172 personnes sont actuellement hospitalisées, dont 57 en soins intensifs. Uh, merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. We're happy to take your questions. Thank you, Minister. As a reminder to everybody on the phone, please press star one to enter the queue. You are limited to one question and one follow-up only. I would also ask that you please take your phones off mute. You will not be audible until your name is called. The first question this afternoon is from Marcella Bernardo, News 1130. Hi, Dr. Henry and Minister Dix. I just wanted to see if you have given any thought yet to possibly starting the Christmas break sooner this year for schools, namely in the Fraser Health and Vancouver Coast Health, Health regions, but possibly across the province. Yeah, so this is something um, I've been looking at for some time, um, whether, you know, what measures we need to take. And we know that schools, and I presented the data again yesterday, schools are a reflection of what's happening in our community. So we're looking at what are the measures that help us reduce risk in our communities and therefore protect our schools more. We can see that transmission rates are less in schools than they are in other um, parts of our community. So they are also, we know, incredibly important for families and for children to have in-person, in-class schools. But we're looking at all of our options. There are a whole bunch of things that are happening, hopefully, uh, within the next months. Um, we need to bend our curve back down. We need to make sure that we're doing everything we can in the community so that we can continue to uh, um, have our in-classroom schooling going for children across the province. So there's other measures we're looking at as well. Um, but uh, across the country, we're discussing all of the options that can help and looking at the data to support them. Do you have a follow-up, Marcella? Yes. Still keeping with schools, I heard this afternoon from a supervisor at a school in Surrey who says that she was told, a student, a student in grade six told her that she only had to isolate for one week after testing positive for COVID-19 and someone at Fraser Health told her it was okay for her to come back to school. So could you maybe explain the parameters for why is it possible that a student might be able or someone who tests positive might be able to return to school or to work? after being in isolation for only one week. And, and this particular child told the supervisor that she didn't need to wear a mask and she wasn't going to. So. <laughs> well, uh, you know, uh, it's hard to comment on what somebody might have told somebody who might have told you. However, um, what we talk about with isolation, there's two things for, for isolation. One, um, it, it, people are no longer infectious to others about 10 days after their symptoms start. So it depends on when the person was tested and when their test came back positive. They may have, if their symptoms were mild um, and, they, um, and they had resolved, um, we are no longer infectious after 10 days. And so that is what we use for clearing people to be able to go back to school or work. Okay. Um, the other t place that we're looking at self-isolation is for people who've been exposed. And when somebody is exposed, it can take up to 14 days. That's the incubation period, we call it. So it can take up to 14 days after you've been exposed before you develop symptoms. For, so if I was exposed to somebody who had COVID-19 in close contact with them yesterday, then I would have to self-isolate for 14 days. And if I developed any symptoms and I got tested and was positive, then I would need to isolate for 10 days from when my symptoms started, assuming that I got better. And the caveats are because we know that people who are immune compromised, who have some more, some more severe illness or end up in hospital, may shed infective virus for longer periods of time. But the general idea um, holds for most people in the community. After 10 days, you're no longer, from the onset of your symptoms, you're no longer infectious to others. Next question is from Binder Sajjan, CTV. Uh, hi, Dr. Henry. Um, I hear you talking about people should think about the way that they were thinking earlier this year when it comes to the pandemic. And it sounds like you are reluctant to, to go back into a lockdown situation. I'm wondering why that is. And um, given these high case numbers this weekend, how close we may be 
to extending the restrictions that are in place now and perhaps even bringing in more. Yeah, so what the difference between what we were thinking about in April and what we know now are we know that there are many things that can continue to happen safely. We know we can safely go to schools. We haven't had outbreaks related to um, restaurants when, when the rules are followed. Small groups, keeping our distance, wearing masks, um, the, the closing hours, we adjusted the hours because we found later in the evening when people were more drinking, less eating, they tended to float the rules. So we me took measures to put things in place that made those environments safe. Um, things like uh, hair salons and nail salons and barber shops, when the rules are followed and when people are following the COVID safety plans, wearing masks, having limited numbers of people, having gaps between people, we're not seeing transmission of this virus. So we're in a much different place than we were in April. But in some ways, we need to be thinking the same vibe as we were in April. And that means thinking about our social gatherings. It's when we're coming together, particularly now, we've learned that this virus spreads quite easily in the colder weather. It spreads indoors. So when we're coming together with people indoors and not keeping our distance, not wearing masks, in those social connections, those social settings, whether it's in our home or whether it's in the lunchroom at work or carpooling to work or um, talking with the other parents at uh, the indoor volleyball game that our kids are playing, those are settings now that we're seeing transmission. So in terms of our social set, uh, connections, we need to start shrinking back to our pandemic bubble, keeping our family close, having our close contact with our family, but not having those unsafe connections with larger numbers of people, whether it's in our home, whether it's at an athletic club, whether it's um, in an environment in, uh, in the community. So that's what I meant by needing to go back, needing to refocus, needing to refocus our social interactions so we can keep those really important things in our community, like our, our surgery restart, like our schools, continuing to function. Do you have a follow-up, Bender? Uh, yes, and this is for my colleague. Um, it's thought that the music teacher at Cambridge uh, School in uh, Surrey could be the source of transmission for some of the students. And just wondering, should specialty teachers be able to teach hundreds of kids across multiple cohorts? Yeah, I know it's a really trying situation and you know, we're sending all of our positive thoughts and wishes to the um, to the teacher in question. Um, I don't know the details of who was exposed to whom. I know that um, the initial exposures were from a community exposure and then um, there was transmission in the school environment. Um, it's a very good point and we are looking at all of the initiatives around some of the specialties um, teachers, particularly music and physical education, where we know there's multiple classes, and making sure that the appropriate safety precautions are put in place for those to happen safely. And uh, this, of course, will make us rethink, relook, make sure that things are being done um, in the best way to protect people. Richard Zussman, Global News. I'd like to ask about what Marcella brought up at the beginning around uh, the school year. And you said you're speaking to federal counterparts about this. What are the pros and cons in either um, bumping up the school break, as in sending kids um, home early, or extending it into January? Are there thoughts on the pros and cons of that? And what is the is there a number of cases or a number of outbreaks that would lead the province to make these changes around the uh, the break schedule? Yeah, so it's not uh, so much the school um, exposures that we're seeing, um, it's the community, but it's also looking at, you know, the things that we're doing in our community. So there's, and I'm talking with uh, my colleagues, so the Chief Medical Officers of Health in the other provinces, and we're all considering, um, you know, what makes sense, what information do we know, what's the data that we have on what's happening both in communities and schools. So we know some of the downsides are that um, there are many essential workers in our community and finding um, places uh, for children to be safely during the day needs to be considered. Um, we know that older children um, will 
naturally congregate in other settings. So how do we make sure that those aren't more risky um, than some of the things that we're seeing uh, uh, happening now? So there are many different considerations that go into this. We want to make sure that uh, we can uh, do it in a way that doesn't adversely affect those businesses that are running safely. Um, but we also want to make sure that our healthcare workers are supported, that they're able to continue functioning. As you know, this is a run up to where we tend to have uh, more um, people in hospital for a variety of reasons. And we're now, of course, seeing a, a surge in COVID patients as well. So there's many considerations that we have. From a medical perspective, I also know that uh, uh, this is the time of year we tend to see over Christmas and into New Year's where we tend to see influenza surge. We're hopeful that this year the measures we're taking might help prevent some of that and that's important. We also know that people want to spend time together over holiday seasons and uh, that can spill over into um, outbreaks in community settings afterwards. So there are many different things we're considering. Um, and we all ne we need to uh, have an understand what the impacts are going to be. And I don't know all of them, so we're consulting with um, different groups, and we'll continue to do that. But you know, if we are going to make this change, it will be a thoughtful change that will be done ahead of time in discussion uh, with the different sta stakeholder groups. Do you have a follow up, Richard? One of the things, Dr. Henry, we're hearing from businesses on the mask mandate. Uh, is a concern that, yes, people are hearing your advice, but without requiring it, customers in many cases are being abusive or rude uh, to store managers or, or people who are working in those settings. So would a mandate not alleviate some of that uh, animosity that is felt uh, in those settings? Yeah, so it, there is an order that requires uh, businesses to have COVID safety plans. And a retail location, for example, should have plans that include mask wearing. And that means making them available to people, making it clear that people need to wear a mask when they're in those, those settings, making sure that staff know when they need to wear masks in their setting as well. And those are enforceable, as I talked about today, in the same way that every other part of what we do in business. And if we look at Quebec, for example, that is um, their model as well, and that the onus is on businesses um, to, to um, make sure that masks are available and that people uh, understand the rules within their business. And what I'm saying is, as a community, we need to recognize that those are rules that keep workers safe, and keep us safe when we're in those um, those businesses, or those restaurants, uh, those retail stores, etc. So we all need to follow those. It doesn't make a difference for me to. Uh, we don't. We have a number of things that we do of personal behaviors, like cleaning your hands. For me, that is the the perspective that we're taking. Uh, from a provincial level. It's not us, it's not me who can um, find somebody. That's not what's going to make a difference here. What's going to make a difference is that people know clearly the rules and the situations that they're going into. The other thing that is clear, and we look at this across the country, when, and so not all provinces have a provincial level uh, mandate. In Quebec, it's, uh, it's, uh, the onus is on businesses and they have a fine on businesses. I don't believe that that's appropriate. But what we need to think about is you know, the, the mask mandate is not in and of itself something that has made a difference in terms of transmission. Many of the settings that we are talking about are settings where people would not naturally wear a mask, like in your home or at a party. So these are things we have to, to take into account. We also know that when there's a fine um, uh, uh, scheme set out that we know that certain populations are disproportionately targeted and we've seen that happen in other communities as well. If you remember earlier on in the pandemic, there was a lot of push to, to find people who weren't maintaining physical distancing outside. This is the same issue. We know that um, people with disabilities, it's not always clear that they're not able to put on or take off a mask. We know that racialized communities and people who are homeless, people who are underhoused, are more likely to be targeted with fines when we have those types of settings. So we are reinforcing the importance of every business to have a COVID safety plan and for businesses that interact with the public, mask wearing should be part of that. 
and that each of us as individuals have to take all of those measures that we have now more than ever. It is important for us to continue to clean our hands, to make sure we're keeping our, our safe distances, to make sure that we are not going into work or school or into public places when we're ill, and to wear a mask when it's appropriate to do so. Next question is from Priyanka Mehta, ZTV. Dr. Bonnie Henry, my first question is, why don't we have temperature checks for students at schools? Yeah, so one of the things that we have learned about this virus is that a fever, so a high temperature, is not something that we're seeing very commonly, particularly in children. So there's not a high yield, as we call it, for temperature checks. Having said that, Obviously, um, feeling unwell, feeling feverish is one of the symptoms that is a very important thing in every day, every child, but also all of the staff and teachers and educators in the school need to do a check with, of themselves to make sure that they're not having symptoms and that they're well enough to come into school. And we have tools that support families to do it for children and staff to do that as well. That is incredibly important, making sure that we have a very low threshold for staying back if we're not feeling well. Do you have a follow-up, Priyanka? Yes, I do have a follow-up. So, uh, Dr. Bonnie Henry, could you please uh, tell us a little bit about how the distribution of the vaccines will look like? Um, we're talking about the COVID vaccine? <laughs> yes. So this is, uh, you know, lots of good news again today, uh, though we have not yet seen the data. So the truth is still uh, out there, as it were. But yeah, it's very exciting to hear that uh, there might be uh, two vaccines available uh, very soon, within weeks months um, and we are preparing across the country. Uh, the federal government has a contract with both of these companies, both Pfizer and Moderna, to uh, receive vaccine here in Canada. And what we are planning for is uh, early in the next year, in the new year, to be able to start distributing that vaccine. We have guidance that has come out based on um, a lot of work that has been done over uh, uh, the last year, based on an ethical framework that we've put together um, as part of our national pandemic planning uh, for many years about who are the target populations who will benefit most from vaccine. Um, and that was released uh, last week by the National Advisory Committee on Immunization. And we are strongly uh, supportive of those priority population groups being the, the first in line for vaccine. Uh, here in the province, we've also across the country de developed some common principles for how vaccine will roll out and we're working on all of those details. So uh, it is logistically challenging. You might have heard the Pfizer vaccine, for example, needs ultra low temperature and there's a whole uh, delivery system for how that will work. Um, and it's a bit of a fussy vaccine in terms of the dose that it's getting and how it's reconstituted. So that means that certain vaccinators will take, uh, will have to deliver that vaccine. The Moderna vaccine uh, also requires freezer temperatures, which is a little easier. We do have some, quite a few of those freezers, minus 20, um, and can be delivered in slightly different ways. So we are working on all of those details. And once we have um, the protocol about how it's going to work and much of that will depend on the vaccine being licensed for use in Canada and for whom it works best and we don't yet have those details. So it's all um, trying to be organized while we uh, still are trying to answer some of the really key questions but that is something that we are spending um, quite a bit of time working on and I think it's a really positive thing for all of us. It's going to make a difference. It's not going to be um, you know, a, a light switch where we're going to be able to go back and never wash our hands again. That will never change. But uh, it will give us uh, you know, an opportunity to start by protecting those who are most at risk, protecting people in our healthcare system. And then I am confident um, you know, by this time next year, we'll have vaccine available for anybody in British Columbia. Mary Brooks, Island Social Trends. Hi, yeah, I'd like to know a little bit more about the use of masks outdoors. Um, a friend of mine was out walking on, on the weekend and she said she passed about 100 people in two hours, none of whom were wearing a mask. 
but it was on a trail, so people were kind of close at some point. So what's the protocol in that sort of situation? Well, the things that we have learned about this virus are that it doesn't transmit very easily outdoors. And it certainly, it takes a period of time. So if I'm walking by somebody, even on a trail, if I'm running past somebody, if I'm walking down a crowded street and, and we're just passing by each other, those are not risky situations in, in, in terms of, of the virus being transmitted to each other. So no, there's not a reason necessarily to wear a mask outdoors. This time of year, as it's getting cold, it actually can be quite helpful. But uh, you know, we should be focusing on those situations where, uh, where we know this virus is more likely to transmit. And that's indoor settings, particularly if we're spending more than 15 minutes um, face to face with somebody. And I think of you know, hairdressing salons and barber shops and nail salons and uh, other places where we're spending time with people. We know that masks can be very effective as, as part of um, the, the different things that we have in place to prevent transmission in those settings. But the outdoor settings are safer. Going for a walk with somebody is safe. Keep your distance as much as possible, but, um, and then you don't need to wear masks. But walking past somebody is not a high-risk situation. Mary, do you have a follow-up? Yes, um, a little more detail on Christmas bubbles and who we have over to our homes. Is it strictly just who already lives in your home, or if your safe six involves other family members who might live in a different household, can they come and visit at Christmas? Uh, you know, I don't know the answer to that yet. What we're telling people right now, and this is because of what we're seeing right now, is if you're in the Fraser Health, Lower Mainland, Vancouver Coastal Health region, you need to stick to your household bubble only. This is thinking back to where we were in April. Those people who are our close contacts, our close household, and you know we've put out some definition of household because it, it's different for different people. It's who our family is, and that may be people that we're related to. It may be people that we are close to. So if people living alone, they may have one or two other people that are in their, their pandemic bubble. And thinking back to what we were thinking about in April, for some families that may, uh, who have children who live with uh, both parents, that may be two families. Right now, that is the focus. In the rest of the, the province, we're starting to see increased transmission in our community. And we're saying you need, and there's an order about this, you need to stick to your safe six. So your household plus those one set of six people maximum that your family is connecting with. But right now, we need to think about reducing all of our social gatherings. We don't, if it's not necessary to visit, don't do it right now. Give it a break, let us get the numbers down. And it's most important in those areas where we're seeing a lot of community transmission, but this is spreading around our province. And we now know that the season makes it easier for this virus to spread. So all of us need to think about no gatherings, supporting our families and our friends in remote ways, in ways that are safe. We have time for one more question. For everyone listening today, Dr. Henry and Minister Dix will release a statement this afternoon with the latest information on cases, hospitalizations, and outbreaks, which you can access at news.gov.bc.ca. For updated information about regional orders, visit gov.bc.ca forward slash regional restrictions. And for information about the province's pandemic supports, visit gov.bc.ca forward slash COVID-19. Last question is from Briar Stewart, CBC. Yes. Hi, Dr. Henry. I know that you addressed this last week at a separate teleconference, but I'm hoping you can clarify what public health officials are seeing when it comes to uh, COVID-19 transmission in South Asian communities. And if rates are, are higher, are there any factors driving that? Yeah, so we have seen quite a lot of transmission in the South Asian community, particularly in the Fraser Valley and the Fraser Health region. Um, but we know that that's where a lot of people of South Asian descent live. And we have a large and very vibrant active community there. So yes, we have seen transmission in that community related to events. But we also recognize that many of the people in the South Asian community are our essential workers. There are people who run our pro uh, food processing plants, our trucking, healthcare workers. Many people in the South Asian community work in our healthcare settings. 
So it's not uh, that we should be targeting a community. We know that there has been transmission in every community. And this virus does not tell the difference between um, where I come from, where I live, what my family's background is. So it has been a challenge for many, and uh, we know that. Um, and we know that there are many heroes in our South Asian community who have been working day and night, uh, whether it's in health care, whether it's keeping food on our tables. So uh, it is one of the areas that we've been working with leaders in the community to help make sure that they are doing everything they can to keep their, their families and communities safe, as we have with the Chinese Canadian community, um, with many other communities around the province. And do you want to yeah. address that? Uh, I mean, first to repeat uh, what Dr. Henry has said, that we've seen uh, significant uh, transmission, and you saw when the uh, information by local health area was released on uh, Thursday, uh, the monthly information and the regular information by health service delivery areas, that uh, the Fraser Health Region is seeing significantly the highest number of cases. Uh, uh, well, over this uh, three-day period, over 1,300 cases, and that 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 area is also an area with uh, relatively high South Asian population. Is why, in terms of our delivery of public health messages, starting in uh, March and April, we've seen significant uh, translation of guidance documents, of the survey we did, of advertising from the beginning in multiple language, including uh, including Punjabi and Hindi and that that will continue. We have a significant, for example, public information campaign uh, now that's targeted on, targeted, of course, in English, but also in uh, Punjabi and in Hindi and in Farsi and in uh, Chinese language, uh, Chinese text, and so on. So uh, we have to continue to make an effort there. It is a significant issue. I think what we've seen in our work with influencers in the community really going back a, a number of months now when we saw a rise in cases in Fraser Health, I think significant effort is being made uh, in the community to deliver that message. I think we saw some impact on that, a significant impact in the celebration of Diwali this weekend. And I'm very appreciative to everyone who uh, showed uh, how to celebrate a major occasion such as Diwali in a safe way. But uh, I think uh, what's also true is that uh, COVID-19 uh, is everywhere in British Columbia and in all communities, that we have over 200 active cases in the Interior Health Authority. For example, we have more active cases right now in Vancouver Island than we've ever had. This is a time when COVID-19 in other jurisdictions in Canada, in, uh, in the United States and across the world is surging in many, many places and British Columbia is one of those places. And so we have to, as public health, have to reach out and deliver that message and we need communities to be leaders as well. And I'm, I'm very pleased to say that many, many people in the South Asian community have taken up that mantle in the last uh, weeks and months and, uh, and we need them to continue to do so. Do you have a follow-up, Briar? I guess I do, just quickly. Um, you talk about significant transmission, so I'm just wondering if that means that the transmission rate, I guess, uh, or the number of people being infected is disproportionately higher than you would expect based on the population level. And if you could just um, answer, uh, Minister Dix, the question about, you know, what's being done to, to reach out uh, to, to the communities in French, that would be great. Thanks. Yeah, and, uh, you know, we don't, as we've mentioned, we don't um, actually have rates by ethnicity of disease, so I can't answer that question with data. Uh, what we are seeing um, is that there are many families affected in the South Asian community and many people live in large multi-generational families and so like other uh, similar communities, uh, when one person's infected it can spread very quickly to many others in that family and we know that there has been, um, there have been people affected across the, the community for sure. Juste en français, pour dire que au commencement de, de la pandémie, au mois de février, au mois de mars, il y avait des cas qui venaient euh, de, de l'Iran, par exemple. On a commencé avec des événements, avec des, des gens qui sont les leaders de la communauté iranienne dans la province, et on fait à peu près la même chose depuis quelques mois. 
euh, euh, surtout dans la région de Fraser Health, mais sur, aussi à Vancouver Coastal Health, un peu partout dans la province. Je pense que ce qu'on fait maintenant, c'est une campagne de publicité importante dans plusieurs langues, euh, y compris euh, le Punjabi et le Hindi euh, dans la province, mais aussi euh, euh, des langues chinoises, euh, aussi le farsi et d'autres langues, euh, parce que je pense qu'il est essentiel de communiquer. Mais il faut se reconnaître aussi que ce n'est pas seulement une question de langue, mais euh, des jeunes de notre société. On a vu depuis quelques mois le fait que des jeunes de 20 à 40 ans euh, euh, sont plus susceptibles de, 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 de tester positifs pour COVID-19 dans la province. Donc, c'est une question de communiquer euh, pas seulement aux gens dans des langues différentes, mais aussi de communiquer directement euh, jeunes, euh, de, par des jeunes aux jeunes actuellement. Parce que c'est de cette fa façon-là, on est défini dans une so société par beaucoup d'éléments et le fait que des gens plus jeunes euh, sont plus susceptibles maintenant de tester positif au COVID-19 est important. Et c'est pour cette raison-là qu'on on a, on a, on a une équipe euh, un peu partout dans la province, mais surtout dans la région de santé de Fraser Health, euh, des jeunes qui mènent cet effort pour communique, communiquer aux autres jeunes euh, ce qui euh, euh, les, euh, les risques les craintes de COVID-19 uh, dans la situation actuelle. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. We'll see you on Thursday. Thanks for joining us.